said, hey, Al, thanks for coming. I spent the morning talking myself into the idea that nobody would be here and I would talk to an empty room, which I guess is okay as long as the camera doesn't see an empty room. So I'm excited to see you all today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about women, the history of women's rights. Um, and I have a background in law. Many of you know that. So typically when I get assigned to do something like this, I start instantly thinking in terms of law. When did laws, when were they passed? It sort of captures the moment in time, right? So it's like, let's see what the law was at a given moment. But keep in mind that the laws come after a lot of struggle, right? So it doesn't mean that it just boom came out of the blue. People have been fighting for these laws to change sometimes over decades. Okay. So I wanted to give you a really quick social movements primer before we start. This is not specific to women's history, but a lot of times when we talk about social movements, what we're actually talking about is a social movements organization, right? So you'll talk about a specific group and what it is doing to protest or to advocate for change. But social movement is actually the push for a change. It's bigger than a social movement organization, right? So you have the women's movement is a social movement and it goes back centuries, not just decades. Within that, there are a lot of women's social movement, social movement organizations that women organize to advocate for specific changes. And we see the same thing for the civil rights movement, right? So civil rights, we can analyze as a social movement across centuries, but we can also talk about the Black Panthers with the NAACP. Those are organizations. Okay. So the social movement is just an organized effort to change laws, policies, or practices by people who do not have individual power to affect change through conventional channels. Basically, it's all of us little peons, right, who alone can't push for a change. But if we all get together and we all combine our voices and we push for a change, we have a lot more power, right? It's a lot more effective for broad groups of people to do it. And in the early case of the women's movement, in the first wave, they literally did not have power because they couldn't vote in a lot of situations. And so they had to try to affect change in other ways. If you can't vote, you can't just go try to pass a bill. You have to get your voice out there. What? Um, so with this, a lot of times with social movements, we'll see waves of it. It's kind of like a roller coaster. And you'll see people are upset about a specific thing. So they'll start working for change on that thing and you're kind of geared up in the social movement and then it'll peak and a couple of things can happen either we get a social change the change that was wanted or some element of the change that was wanted and the social movement kind of slowly starts to slow down because it's been successful right or it gets crushed and they kind of stop for a little bit to rec uh, recollect themselves and reorganize okay so that'll come back and so we'll have a peak we'll have a little bit of a change and people are happy, like, ooh, we got what we were after, okay? So movement kind of slows down a little bit, but then a new thing will come to light, right? So it might've been first getting the right to vote. So after the 19th Amendment is passed, then women's movement kind of slows down a little bit and gets quiet. And then we hit the 70s and there's new complaints and it starts ramping up. But if you're studying social movements as a sociologist, that's all connected for us. We kind of look at it across the course of everything. So in the women's movement, you actually see multiple waves. Um, so the first wave was about specific rights. Most often we talk about the right to vote. We're also gonna talk about the right to own property and the right to participate in sports as we do this. The second wave is really more focused on equality of rights. And then you'll see some of the same complaints, right? So first it's focusing on, we want the right to do something. And then the second wave is focused on no, we just don't want the right. We want actual equality of this. The third wave focused on sexual harassment and social treatment. And some people feel like this is still going on. This has been during your lifetime, right? Where it was really like, hey, we don't just want equality on the books. We want to be treated as humans in the workplace and other situations. The Me Too movement would fit into this third wave. There's some questions on whether reproductive rights fits into the third wave or whether it's become a fourth wave. So have we have we moved on to something new? 
or is this really just a continuation? I can't really answer that question. We kind of have to see what happens in the future so that we can look backwards and analyze what's going on right now. So we are gonna talk about a few specific things. There's just way too much to cover everything. And I hope that you guys will stop me if you have questions or if you have comments. The other thing I wanna emphasize before we get started is this is not a men versus women issue. Throughout the history of the women's movement, there have been men who fought for equal treatment for women who were on that side and were part of the social movement. And there have been women who didn't want equal treatment or didn't care about it. They were content with the status quo. It was comfortable for them and they did not want the same equality of rights that other women were, okay? So this was not a men were on the side of oppression and women were on the side of equality. It's much more nuanced than that. So keep that in mind. Okay, so I wanna start with property and economic rights. I want you guys to imagine that you legally could not own anything in your own name. How would that sit with you guys? Couldn't own a car, couldn't own a house, didn't own your own wages if you worked. They belonged to somebody else. You guys be happy with that situation? That I hope not, right? That's kind of a bare minimum. It's like, at least I own my own effort. So there is a term in law called coverture. Um, Blackstone, Blackstone was an old English expert on law. Um, he is cited a lot in the law and he has a dictionary where he defines things. So coverture definition says by marriage, the husband and wife are one person in the law. All right, so a lot of times we hear in religious ceremonies, wedding ceremonies, they become one in spirit or united in a purpose. This is one in law. And the way it's interpreted is that the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage. She ceases to exist as an individual person, or at least is incorporated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection, and cover she performs everything. It's where coverture comes from. So the woman in marriage ceases to exist as a legal human being, and the husband represents the couple. Okay? Is comfortable with that? <laughs> so it sounds very foreign to anybody. Like what? Wait, she ceases to exist for legal purposes? Yeah. So let's look at what some of those rights meant. Or some of those lack of rights. So early on, we see a lack of property ownership because of this coverture idea. Okay, in 1769, notice you guys remember when did the United States become a country? Like when did the United States come into being? They're all very quiet. Interact. What do we know? Was it after 1769? How about that? When was the Revolutionary War? <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys. 1776, okay? So in 1769, we are still English colonies. And they adopted the English practice that married women cannot own property. So if you have property from your family, your, your father or a male relative controlled that property on your behalf. And when you married, that property became your husband because you became your husband's and you ceased to exist as a legal entity. You're not a legal person, you can't own property, okay? So the property was all owned by the husband, okay? We start to see some shift in that pretty early on in the colonies. So 1771, New York gives women a small voice. She still can't own property. Okay, but if she brings something to the marriage, the husband can't sell it without her permission. So without this law, if you brought property to marriage, you could wake up one morning and your husband got rid of it for his own benefit and you had no say whatsoever. New York required you to at least sign the documents transferring it. Okay, 87, Massachusetts actually allowed women to conduct business. But we'll find out, if you like dig into this, you find out that this wasn't really motivated by equality for women. It was a practicality for the family. In Massachusetts specifically, they were a lot of seagoing people and the husband would take off on his fishing or whatever boat and be out at sea. And if the wife legally could not run the business while he was gone, the family couldn't survive, right? So it was practical. It was about the family's survival, not equal rights for the wife. 
Connecticut in 1809 let women write wills. They still couldn't own property, but they could write a will passing on what they didn't own to the next generation, okay? A biggie in this though, there was a big feature of this law, okay? Connecticut then allowed someone other than the woman's husband to control property. So if you had property before you came to marriage, a husband or a brother could continue to manage that, which I think hopefully in the law, they felt like maybe the husband or the brother would really care about your well-being, perhaps more than the husband, which is a little bit sad, right? But if they were concerned that your husband was going to bankrupt you, that you were going to leave nothing left, they could maintain control of your property for you so that at least if your husband died or something drastic happened, that property was intact. But you still didn't control it, and the benefit of the property still went to the husband. So any income that the property made was the husband's. How are you feeling about this? I think how different would your life be if everything that you used on a daily basis did not belong to you? If you had to have your a husband's or a brother's or a father's permission before you could do any kind of business, sell or buy any kind of property, and if you had money somehow and you did buy it, it wasn't yours anyway. All right. Okay. So keep this in mind. This is where we're at. But we're going to start to see a transition. And again, this is motivated by practical needs of the family. Um, so in Mississippi in the early 1900s, sorry, that should be 1800s, 1839, not 19 typo. In the early 1800s, they were having kind of an economic downturn. And what motivated this law was a husband who lost all of his stuff. He got into debt and he couldn't pay his debts. And the creditor showed up to take all of his stuff away. And because of coverture, he also tried to take all the wife's property away, which would have left the family with what? Literally nothing, nothing to maintain the family. So Mississippi passes a law that says that the husband can't sell the wife's property without her permission. Now, she doesn't still control it. She can't sell it on her own. She can just refuse to sign the documents. And if she refuses, the family stays under the husband's control. And then the family still has something that stays under the husband's control. And the family still has something to live on, right? So again, it's not really motivated by equality. They're not trying to give women equal rights. They're trying to make sure the family has an economic basis. Okay. 1842, we started to see some big changes and we're coming up towards the tipping point where we're gonna see this move into ownership. Um, New Hampshire lets women own and manage property if the husband is incapacitated. So if your husband has a stroke or somehow becomes unable to manage business, the wife steps in as the second person in the couple. <laughs> Sounds like maybe that should be obvious, but that's a big change. It wasn't the wife before, it was somebody else. So now the wife doesn't even have her husband managing her property, it's somebody different, okay? 1844, men in Massachusetts got women's separate economy. You guys know what that means? What do you think separate economy might mean? It's wages. If you work, now you own your own money. You don't have to take it home and turn it over to your husband. That is your separate income that you control. That's a big step. And this doesn't seem to be motivated by much other than women should have a few more rights. Okay. Now, some people are still arguing up to this point. It's still kind of the economic basis of the family, but it's starting to shift where people are like, well, why shouldn't, why shouldn't women own property the same as men own property? Like, why, why do we not have this? But there's a countervailing, again, social movements are always about push back and forth, right? So you've got one side pushing and saying, we need equality, we need more rights. And the other side is like, nope, it's fine, you don't. Um, so this is a quote from a case, right? This means it's a, a lawsuit in the Illinois Supreme Court. Okay, so Illinois, Chicago, Milwaukee. Okay, It is simply impossible that a married woman should be able to control and enjoy her property as if she were sold without practically leaving her at liberty to annul the marriage. So what's one of the practical consequences of women can't own property and don't control their income? What happens if it's a bad marriage? What are her options? She has none. Anything she brought to the marriage is her husband. Anything she's earned during the marriage is her husband. That leaves her unable to leave. And this lawsuit, this decision, 
It's flat out acknowledging that. If women have the right to control and enjoy their property, they could leave the marriage, right? Okay. But we're, again, we're at the tipping point. We still got a fight going on. We got some cool stuff coming. So first, quiz time. Okay. Um, when were women able to open a line of credit without a male cosigner? So in other words, this would mean have their own credit card in their own name, take a loan out in their own name without having their husband's permission or their husband signing for them. What year? I want you guys to guess. You know, I can stand up here and wait you out. Most of you have me in class. So <laughs> give me at least, let's do four different guesses. You don't have to be right. Just give me a guess. What year? What year do you think women could have their own line of credit? I'll let adults participate in what? 1960. We gotta go for 1960. 1975. Anything else? What else? 1976. 76. I feel like we're playing prices right now. <laughs> 1964. Okay. You guys are much closer than I thought you might be. You all went to the kind of the later, mid to later 1960s. Um, it's 1974. Okay. Just for a frame of reference, I was born in 1971. So during my lifetime, now admittedly I was like three, but during my lifetime, there was a period when women could not have their own line of credit, could not open a credit card, okay? That's tough, right? Okay, but let's get back to, we're changing now. We're forging ahead with property ownership. And it starts with New York. A lot of things happen in New York. It's a big population base. And New York gives us our first big law. They passed the Married Women's Property Act. And this is about equality, okay? It's the early one, but they give the right to own property and control wages. And they also pass in this law that women have the right to custody of their children if they separate. Now that doesn't mean women have to be awarded children, right? But prior to this, women who left their husband didn't have any right to their children. The children stayed with the husband and stayed with all of the property. So that's kind of a biggie in terms of equal treatment for husbands and wives. And now it's gonna go pretty fast. 1900, the last state grants the right to own property and receive her own wages to married women, okay? Single women, single women are a little nebulous throughout here, but I want you to keep in mind that very few women stayed single, right? Very few. For the most part, their, hus their father was in the role of what a husband would have been for other women as far as control. Some states, single women had slightly squishier ability to own some property, but there was so much social stigma if you didn't get married that I don't know how much of a compensation that was. Um, then we're going to go into a lull. So remember the roller coaster, right? So we had this big push and we got a lot going on in the early 1900s, not just with property, but with right to vote. And all that kind of gets resolved and interest tails off. And then we're going to they hit the second wave feminism. So in 1960, women technically won the right to open a bank account. Prior to this, if you walked into a bank and said, I'd like a bank account, they'd laugh at you. No, you can't have a bank account. But this win wasn't much of a practical win because banks still had the right to deny on other grounds. So if you walked in and said, I'd like a bank account, even though legally you had the right to have one, a bank did not have to give you one at their bank. And a lot of banks denied rights. 1974, with the line of credit, was a much bigger stage for women. Here, practically, women could walk into a bank, and now they had a legal right that banks could not deny. Okay? And then in 1981, finally, okay? So I was 10 years old. I was going to fourth grade. I had no idea all this stuff was going on. But SCOTUS, over, the Supreme Court of the United States, overturns a state law that basically declared the husband the legal head of the household. So this is the end of our property ownership issue, right? Where now legally a state cannot declare the husband superior to the wife in any situation within the marriage, okay? Legally, that's where we end. Practically speaking, there's still work to be done with couples, right, aligning with the law. So the day-to-day -day lived experience isn't done, but legally we're done. So thoughts about property, any questions? thoughts okay i got a couple more points just really quick that are kind of tied to property 
Um, so here we go, Dwight D. Eisenhower, right? He's the president of the United States around World War II-ish time, okay, just to orient this. He says, legislation to apply the principle of equal pay for equal work without discrimination because of sex is a matter of simple justice. So throughout this, we also have the issue of equal pay for equal work going on. But it's not the same debate that we are having now. So now there's a lot of discussion about it. We're looking at statistics, how much do women make compared to men um, on, on in average, right? So across all sorts of professions. And it's a very nuanced discussion. So there's issues with um, women dropping out to raise children. There's issues with what careers people choose to go into, what where they see themselves represented. So it's not a strict inequality of in this same job, men and women are, are paid less. But before 1963, they were. So I just wanted to show you, this was an actual teacher's pay scale before 1963. It was out in the open. This was published. Men and women made less for the same job. So this was for teachers, which sets it up pretty clearly because you guys know what teachers do, right? So do you think male teachers do more work than female teachers in the classroom? It's a pretty equivalent job, okay? And this also lines it up by the years of service. So if you were teaching elementary school, your very first year as an elementary school teacher, women were paid $600 and men were paid $900. It's their first year. There's no argument that one is doing a better job or anything like that. It's just a $300 pay gap. And it gets bigger as we go on until the very maximum you can make as a woman teaching elementary school is $1,320. And the men can make 2,160. That's a 62% gap. And it's not about what job did you pick or working, how many hours you work or anything like that. It is just a blatant, we pay women less, okay? So that has also been one, but we're not gonna talk about it anymore. We're gonna talk about sports. So you guys wanna talk about property and money anymore? Let's switch to sports. I'm not good at keeping track of time, Alexa, so you'll have to like give me a time to shut up. Got like 30 minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So sports, inequalities in sports. This is from an 1806 magazine. The constitution of women is adapted only to moderate exercise. Their feeble arms cannot perform work too laborious and too long continued. And the graces cannot be reconciled with fatigue and sunburning. Okay. This was the approach for a long time. Women don't sweat, women don't work hard, women have weak little muscles. If women do exert themselves, they're not ladies. They're lower class, um, lower income women, they're recent immigrants, okay? So being frail is sort of a sign of class and your ladiness, I guess, for lack of a better term, okay? So what does this mean in terms of sports? How many of you are athletes? Okay. Yeah, some people I think that are asleep. <laughs> okay. So the early lack of access to sports. Now there were again mild physical exercises that women were socially permitted to do. Right. So the 19th century, that's the 1800s. Social norms allowed some things, but think about how race and class and sex discrimination are coming to play into this all together. I think about the intersectionality of this. Sports that were allowable for women, tennis, croquet, archery, and swimming. What do you need for access to any of those? Money. Money, right? Those are not things that are free and easy to do without the right equipment. Now, I should say swimming. I just ran out of space on the line. But it was kind of a leisurely, they called it sunbathing swimming. So, you know, delicate paddling through the lanes. Not like competitive swimming, okay? Um. I got a picture of, so they were playing tennis, but they were playing in long skirts and not, not what we would think of as a female athlete today, All right? And the rationale for this was in a large part that it would damage women's physiology, their bodies, um, but a lot of that was tied up into fertility. This concern that if women were athletes, they would not bear children. So we had to not exercise so that we could have good fertility. Okay, so how does this start to change? Okay, well, I figured the Olympics was a good measuring spot, right? The Olympics started in 1896, it, well, 
it resumed in 1896, the modern Olympics, but women didn't participate. So women first participated in 1900, and this down here shows both the number of events that were available to women and also the total number of women athletes. So it's about two or 3% in 1900. About 97% of the Olympics is men, about 3% is women. And again, they're doing like archery and, you know, tennis, okay. Um, golf was in there, okay. And you can kind of see how it grows over time. And in 2024, the coming Paris games, they are anticipating that 50% of the athletes will be women, okay. Actual equality in terms of access to playing the sports. So that's pretty cool, okay. Here's a quiz question for you again, okay. Men competed in the Olympic marathons beginning in 1896. So when they reinstituted the Olympics, they included a marathon for men, 1896. When do you think the women's marathon did that? What year were women able to compete in the marathon, in the Olympics? Huh? Be louder. 1980? Okay. Other thoughts? 19 wins? 1990s? In the 1995? You guys are such good guessers over this. Um, anybody know why the 1980 Olympics was interesting for the United States? Was that the Berlin one? It's, it's Cold War. It was Russia, right? We didn't participate. We boycotted because of the Cold War. Okay. So the U.S. was not involved in 1980. Um, women actually had the marathon added in 1984. Okay. So you guys are doing great. Um, Wendy, in the early Olympics, not the modern Olympics, but in the early Olympics, women were not allowed to participate right. or even be there. Yes, they could. And they were be, they were put to death if they yes. snuck in. And in order to assure that everyone participated naked. Mm -hmm. Very different. Can you imagine the Olympics now if everybody participated naked? <laughs> <laughs> That would be different. Okay, so I wanted to focus on marathons a little bit because I find this kind of fascinating and it's tied into the whole idea of can women physically do a marathon, right? Are they physically capable of doing a marathon? So in the 1928 Olympics, they added the 800 meters for women, but several women collapsed. In hindsight, a lot of it was due to lack of training, right? Lack of training in a race event. So they pushed themselves too hard. Now I have to confess that if somebody took me out and said run 800 meters and you have to meet this time or I don't know what, you're, I'm gonna shoot you, I would probably collapse as well, right? But I also have not trained with running at all. 800 meters is not really that long in terms of races, but they consider it a distance time. And so all distance races for women were excluded after this until 1960 when they added the 800 meters back in. They actually discussed removing women from the games completely because of this collapsing in the 800 meters. It was seen as evidence that women physically were not capable of high level of athletic exertion and performance, okay? So what about outside of the Olympics? Um, we're gonna get down here to the Olympic role in a minute, but I think I'll skip ahead. One of the things for an event to be included in the Olympics, their rules are that the sport has to be widely practiced in at least 25 countries on at least two continents. So they're not wanting regional sports to be an Olympic event. They want it to be something that basically much of the world participates in. And that is a rationale to keep the marathon out for a long time because women aren't allowed to compete in other marathons. So the Boston Marathon's what if not the most famous, it's one of the most famous, right? Okay, um, in 1972, women were officially allowed to run the Boston Marathon. But this didn't happen without a lot of fights. We had women that tried to run earlier who were basically physically trying to pull them off of the course, and we'll see a photo of that in a minute, who were disqualified, who showed up registered but were not refused a bib. So they had to fight to get officially recognized so that they could do it. That happened in 1972, and that's kind of seen as a setup now. If women are in the big marathons in the United States and Europe, now we're on two continents, now we're across 25 countries, now it's eligible for inclusion. But think about how that works legally. 
the Olympic can set up a rule that on its face makes a lot of sense. And I'm not even really criticizing the rule in general, right? It makes sense you want it to be a worldwide sport. But in application, that rule keeps women's events from being added because if women aren't participating in these events around the world, they cannot do it in the Olympics, right? So sometimes we have laws set up that look like they have nothing to do with equality, but contribute to inequality in the world that's around us. So I wanted to give you just a little bit more, okay? Um, this is Jock Simple, okay? So in 1967, he said, I'm not prejudiced against women, they just can't run in my race. He's the organizer of the Boston Marathon. And this is him, okay? This is a woman who registered for the Boston Marathon. She used her initials because it was a habit of hers to use her initials. She wasn't trying to hide the fact she was a woman. In fact, she showed up with this hair, wearing lipstick, okay? When he got her bib. So she wasn't trying to pretend she was male to get away with it. She just wanted to run in the Boston Marathon. And nothing in the rules said women couldn't. They just didn't let them. Right, it wasn't excluded this time. And so this is Jock Simple, who is the, uh, I guess, chair, the coordinator, the, the big guy for the Boston Marathon. He is so angry at this that he is running after her in the middle of the marathon, trying to drag her away, trying to pull the bib off of her so that she cannot finish the race and have a time, okay? But I wanted to include this, showing you how people change too, right? As times change, as people start to see things as they have evidence, their opinion changes. Right. So here we have five years later, Jock Simple says, oh, the women ran well today, the Boston Marathon, and they deserve to be in the race. So five years later, he has changed his mind. And here he is with the same female. They become friendly. He becomes a supporter. OK, so just know that as social norms change, people can also change their minds. Things that we thought were normal 50 years ago that might have seemed okay, seem less okay, okay? And that's true for people as well as laws and such. All right, any thoughts on sports so far? So how about Briar Club? Um, so Marian Pesky was kind enough to come and share her experience. She's, how long? I mean, over 50 years, I know. It's 55. 55 years at Briar Club largely doing a lot of the athletic stuff, right? And so these are, this is her information that she shared with me. And you'll correct me if I get something wrong, right? Okay, so before 1970, the men who were fairly new to Briarcliff at this point, right? They had not been, we had not had men at Briarcliff for very long, but the men came into Briarcliff and started competing in the NAIA, which we competed now. But there were no women's sports in the NAIA. It didn't have women's sports. It didn't have a league. It didn't run championships for women's sports. So the women participated through the AIAW, which was not a league like we could understand. It was sort of an organization that allowed schools to come and participate in things, but not with a kind of a routine competition, standings, championships for the league, right? So I got that right, Marion? Basically, they did, they did eventually run national championships okay. through AIW. Okay, so they added championships as we went along. Okay, so the, in the 1970s, the women's teams from the I, I have trouble saying this, the IACOTA, okay, right? The IACOTA Conference for volleyball, basketball, and eventually softball. I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to start. This is all available if you want it later. Um, they had a tiny budget. So one of the things that I found super interesting was that the budget helped a little bit with gas for women to travel. They had to take their own vehicles and it was enough to buy one set of competitive t-shirts, t-shirts with numbers on them, one set for every women's team. So you didn't have your own jersey. You got a signed t-shirt with a number on it. And at the end of the season, those had to be passed on to the next team so that they could also compete using the same shirts. And the women had to buy their own shorts to compete. Those were not provided. Okay. And um, I didn't put in this, the PowerPoint that Marion reminded me of things like playing softball in shorts is not always physically comfortable if you're trying to slide into base and things like that. So they didn't have stuff. And the solution provided at the time was, well, they could maybe use the men's pants, right? The baseball players? It, we didn't have baseball. Oh, we didn't have baseball yet? It was a faculty slow pitch summer. Program. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, yeah. 
So the faculty had male faculty, but male faculty could play in a slow pitch league, and they had pants, proper baseball or softball pants, right? And the idea was that the girls could wear those. Yeah, we could borrow. Them. So imagine borrowing from the faculty, the full size male faculty, and how that would work for girls playing softball, for young women playing softball. Okay. So Title IX gets passed in 1972, and that brought some scholarship money. It brought a little bit more equality, but still not what we would think of as equality today. And he means um, the men got the prime pr practice times. We didn't have all the facilities today then that we have today, not all the buildings. So the men got the practice times, followed by the intramural teams. And then finally, the women's teams got the, the last time. They had to practice early. They had to practice late. And I don't remember exactly where it was in the timeline, but what we think of as a theater now was actually the large gym. We didn't have Flanagan. So it was a much different environment. And basically there was not support for women fielding competitive teams, right? Not as we would think of women's sports today, okay? So we find a transition um, in, 1990, in 1980, the NAIA was the first league to add women's sports at the college level. The NCAA followed in 81 and 82. So again, I was surprised by that because I was born in 1971. So again, this is during my lifetime and they just did not have organizations. The organizations that offered men's sports did not also offer women's sports. They were left out of it. Okay. So in the early 80s, Briarcliff was still competing in the AIAW. Um, and the women's volleyball made the national tournament that that was order was offering. Um, and the response was, that's a lot of money. Why should, what's the benefit of supporting the women? How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to go to the national championship and, for, and play? <clears throat> this doesn't make sense, right? So not a lot of support. So but the, the huh? city community came through. Yeah, you did go and compete, right? We did go and yeah. compete. So, but not with the full backing of the university. Okay. Um, so Flanagan opened in 1983, which allowed more equal practicing times. And basically it started improving, right? With the law, with the facilities and Briarcliff women jumped to the NAIs in the 1990s. Okay. So again, this was, I keep telling you when I was born, I went to college in 1989, right? So this is as I was going to college, women at Briarcliff were barely getting to compete in the same league on the same footing as male athletes did. So any questions? Mary is a great resource. If you have any questions about sports at Briarcliff, I have a lot of her field questions as well. Did you guys know it was that late that the competitive, competitive situation became more equal? Right? All right, I am gonna run out of time. I always talk too much long and make too much. I did want to talk a little bit about government service. Okay, now there, this is before or during the right for women's rights to vote. Think again, remember coverture and that whole sentiment. Po politics is no place for a woman, for women. Consequently, the privilege should not be granted to her. The mother's influence is needed in the home. The men are able to run the government and take care of the women. Do women have to vote in order to receive the protection of a man? Okay. So again, this is all wrapped up in terms of the husband can represent the wife. The father can represent the daughter. They don't need to have a separate legal personhood. And this was the sentiment. Okay. So quiz time again. Which state was the first one to give women the right to vote? Okay, not nation, but which state and what year did that happen? Let's do state first. Give me some guesses. What state do you think first gave women the right to vote? Massachusetts. We got a Massachusetts, Maine, did you say? Massachusetts, Maine, Montana. Montana. You're getting closer geographically. It was Wyoming. And Wyoming wasn't a state yet, Wyoming was a territory. We'll talk about why that matters. Okay. What year do you think that happened in? I gave you a hint with the fact they were a territory, if you know Wyoming statehood facts, which I don't. So, or I didn't let it out. What year? You guys have to speak up. Like, 1907. 
Okay, way before 1970. Okay. So it has to be before the 1920s because when we got the right to vote nationally, right? So, what? 1914? Other guesses? Wyoming was a state by then. 1918? When I hear 1918 now, I used to just think World War One, and now I think World War One and Spanish flip. Like they're connected in my head. Okay. Any other guesses? Anybody want to guess in the 1800s? Getting closer. Okay. Oh, my battery is running low. It's a good thing I'm almost done. 1869. Okay. Now, there's some interesting thoughts on this. I read a bunch. Some people argue that this was actually brought up as a joke. But unfortunately for them, the governor went ahead and signed it. So it was sort of a manipulation of like, hey, this is a joke. This is never going to get passed. And then the governor's like, well, shoot, I can't veto this. That's going to be very unpopular after it passed the legislature. Um, other people have pointed more practically to the fact that Wyoming was a territory, not a state. And in the territories in the West, they didn't have a lot of women. They had a whole lot of men. And I don't know if you guys have ever been someplace where there's a whole lot of men and not a whole lot of women, but the men that are there that don't have a woman want more women to come. Okay. Kind of like balance there so people can like couple up and stuff. Right. So one of the thoughts is that, hey, if women have the right to vote, they'll see that we value them and they will want to come to Wyoming. Okay. So law passes and it sticks and it actually is followed pretty quickly in the 